On this episode, I spoke to Jude Gamilla, who is the founder and CEO of Golden. He uh, sold his previous startup back in 2016 for $45 million, and he's gone on to invest in over 180 companies, a bunch of name brands in there that you will be familiar with, but also a couple that have hit unicorn status, but some of the more notable ones, Boom, Airtable, Gusto, uh, Superhuman, he has quite a touch of uh, investing in early stage startups and resulting in quite great growth. And uh, now he's gone on to working on Golden on a search problem. We talk about in this podcast in regards to the future of search, how he sees search moving, how intent does matter, and also just general conversations on how people look for information. I think Golden's doing something very special with how they are trying to capture and validate more of this information. Definitely, if you're familiar with Wikipedia, the context of what Golden is doing is about a couple hundred X in terms of that ambition. But here's the podcast without any uh, further ado. Hey, Jude, thanks for being on the podcast. I appreciate it. Yeah, thanks for having me, Emmett. Absolutely. So I did do an introduction, but I could not do justice without uh, you giving the audience a little insight in terms of who you are and kind of what you're doing right now. Sure, yes. So I'm currently the CEO and founder of Golden. And what we're trying to do with Golden is map out all the entities that are out there. So every topic, every business, every scientist, every technical topic, every concept. So we're really trying to build something that is at 1,000x larger scale than the current sets of knowledge out there in the public, i.e. Wikipedia. And uh, previous to that, I founded HazeApp and went through Y Combinator more than 11 years ago. And I sold HazeApp for about 45 million in 2016. And I also invest on the side. So I invested in 200 startups. Eight of them have become unicorns like Airtable and Carter and you know Calm.com and Superhuman and Linear and Atrium and Ironclad and Mercury and all these cool companies, Ginkgo Bioworks, Benchlink, Stranus. So I'm really interested in technology in general across many fields. And I'm interested in science and thinking and uh, yeah, Golden is this platform to try and unlock all this information that's out there on the public web and try and compile it and put it in one place for people to look things up. Fantastic. So just the initial question. So you're obviously an accomplished investor. And if you ever have any lottery number tickets that you're looking to invest in, uh, share it with us because I'm sure you have a golden touch here. But um, why Golden? So you, you know, like, and the reason I'm asking that is you're obviously doing fantastic investing. You don't have to go back to running a company at this point. But uh, why Golden and why go back to it? Yeah, that's a great question. So for me, there are different ways to spend your time, right? So you could spend your time on your family and your network. And you know that's a very valid way to spend your time. Or you could spend your time trying to invent something and either an idea or a machine, say in the academic world. And I think that's very noble and important. Or you could spend your time trying to make money. And there's different ways to do that. You could spend your time trying to make money in any way possible that has no constraints. You know, zero sum game, negative sum game, or positive sum game. I'm interested in the positive sum game way of making money, where making money is the byproduct to do it again, and your positive sum gain is something good for society. So I think different people have, you know, obviously people have different personality traits and they have things they enjoy doing. I like building products. So I actually really enjoy working through all the problems in the product and the details there and creating something new and working on something challenging. So I really enjoy building a company. And that's why I've spent the majority of my time on Golden and also, I went out looking for a team that could be building this because I also looked at doing a supersonic jet company and I came across Boom and went and backed those guys because they were very, very far ahead in their thinking and the team they put together. I couldn't find anyone building a database of knowledge that is done in a way that I think is the way to do it. So, you know, sometimes you got to go build it yourself and that's the choice there. So, yeah, technically I don't have to work again, but I choose to work on this mission and I think it's really engaging and, and important for the world and it needs to happen. That's why I'm putting most of my time on it. Interesting. I was speaking uh, at a session with Dennis Mortensen, uh, founder of X.AI, and uh, he articulated very similar of finding a problem that needs to be solved and no one's bothered with it yet. And that becomes attractive because that is uh, solving a problem that you want solved for yourself first and foremost. I guess when it comes to what Golden does and when I was researching for the podcast, I drew analogies of Wikipedia. And to provide some context to everyone, what is the difference? So if Wikipedia exists, why does Golden need to exist? So there are many differences. So one of the large differences is that, so if we zoom back 20 years ago, 
or 19 years ago to the start of Wikipedia, this is pretty early web. You know, we don't have all the social components and real identity. AI technologies is much earlier. Data portability and all the data sets that could be out there are not really connected. So the decisions that are being made there on some policies, i.e. to cover notable topics. So Wikipedia covers notable topics. The notable is a fairly arbitrary concept in my mind. You know, that this means that they have 6 million topics, which is quite a lot, but there are many other entities out there. So I think there's, you know, between 10, 20 billion entities that are worth covering, which is, you know, 1,000x, order of magnitude 1,000x more. If we look at some examples, Naval Ravikant, you know, he's a super angel and backed many companies. He does not have a page on Wikipedia. And uh, he has a kind of mention in the angel list page, but he does not have a full page that's detailed and dedicated to him. SV Angels, pretty institutional in the history of Silicon Valley, backing a bunch of companies, Ron Conway. Their page was deleted from Wikipedia for non-notability. Clarice Phelps, co-discoverer of Element 117. Her page was deleted from Wikipedia. Even though she's co-discovered an element in the periodic table, she's not notable enough, in their view, to be included in Wikipedia. And the list goes on. The list goes on to like lots of small, innovative private companies, distribute bio and all this kind of stuff. And then for the stuff they do cover, I mean, some of the stuff they cover is amazing. Like the pages are the best on the web and pretty hard to beat. But for many things, you know, when I was searching through the web, and it's not just Wikipedia, it's the general state of the web, to find information on things like interesting companies or technologies or academic concepts, the information was very spread and disparate. And it was stuck in academic papers. It's stuck on a forum. It's stuck in on a company web page. It's over in this private data set or this public data set is over on Wikipedia. So it was all over everywhere. And that to me is a problem that we want to compile it and pull it together. The other component is that, you know, it's not as structured and as queryable as I would like it. So, you know, I want to be able to query in pretty sophisticated ways the data sets and in an easy and intuitive way as well. So the interface being updated to have like modern shortcut keyboard commands and Using AI to solve the problem as well was the other big opportunity that, okay, if the scale of the opportunity is 1,000x, how can we use AI to help automate the problem and remove, not just remove human tasks, repetitive tasks from the data collection, but also find data that we would have never got in because, you know, the various inferences that could be made between all the data points that a human would normally make. So not just, you know, saving time, but also having a better answer. So I think that there's various pieces in here of like, We are missing the database of everything that you could just tap into on an API or query interface or look up on the page. And then we are missing all these topics that, you know, some of them I just mentioned, you know, CRISPR-Cas 13, CRISPR-Cas 9a, et cetera. There isn't a page for those things. And it should be done as soon as it's mentioned on the web. If it's a real thing, and there's lots of debate of like what that means, like that should be covered. And that is not being covered right now. So I'd like to fix that. Interesting. In terms of the sheer size, you mentioned 10 billion data points, and I guess uh, Wikipedia is 6 million. When you're providing 10 million data points, how are you able to ensure, I guess, a level of quality or I guess accuracy maybe is a better term in in terms of what people are viewing? I want to clarify what data points. So when I said 6 million topics and 10 billion entities that we're going for on Golden or more, we're not actually talking about data points. So the data points is much, much larger the data points might be, when we say an entity, we're talking about, you know, say you as a person or your company, then the data points, you could have hundreds or thousands of data points on that single entity. So when we're saying 10 billion entities, like 10 billion things, but the number of data points is much, much larger. We're talking like, you know, we want to be in the quadrillion, <laughs> you know, more than 100 trillion, no kidding you, like more than 100 trillion data points. So the scale of the data points is much, much, much larger than 10 billion. It's kind of like a technical point, but I wanted to clean it up. And then the second part on the quality, so there's lots of interesting things you could do on quality, right? One of them is you know, bringing primary source evidence to the table. So if you write a sentence and make a claim, and this is an interesting one um, where you know there was a case study behind this, but uh, many of them. So if you make a claim and write a sentence, you should be able to provide evidence that's not just pointing at another website, but you should be able to provide the direct document that backs it up as well. And you can do this in a court of law and you can do this in science and you can do this in business. So new evidence types is one of the ways to do it. The other way to do it is to also have AI reading the sentence and extracting the claims and cross comparing it against the rest of the corpus, rest of the information that you've collected and saying, is this inconsistent? Is this claim inconsistent? So 
This page is saying this company was found in 2006. This page is saying the company was found in 2009. So we've got a problem there. Mm -hmm. So you can build a consistency checker and you can use AI to build a consistency checker. The other part is bringing real identity to the platform. So in Wikipedia, it's not real identity. It's uh, anonymous, pseudo-anonymous. And I think in some cases, people have the real identity. So it's a spectrum. And for us, it's real identity. So you're going to have your real identity do it. This means that you cut out potential for sock puppets or and you get the context of the person that's made the edit or making the claim. So that can help user behavior as well and check for validity. And then there's another attack on the validity as well, which is if someone makes a claim, so say you say Cerebus, you know, that AI chip has a power requirement of 15 kilowatts. That is a lot of power. So maybe you could do some statistical analysis and say, well, all the rest of the chips are running at one kilowatt or 500 watts or 100 watts or one watt. But 15 kilowatts sounds wild. That's like, you know, one eighth of a Tesla running in a chip. So you can use statistics as well to try and provide you know, information on validity. And another, another attack on the problem is also to do something what we call high resolution citations. So in normal academia and Wikipedia, when you write a paragraph or write a sentence, at the end of the sentence, you have a citation. And the problem with that is that it doesn't tightly bind the claim, i.e. you might have one number in your sentence that you're trying to back up. And you know, normally you just put a citation at the end of the paragraph or sentence. I think that's a bit loose and we're trying to make it so you can tightly bind the claim so that for that specific value you wanted to back up, you can actually highlight it in golden and then give a citation. So you could have many of these little nested highlights. And then on the other side, we want to say, well, where is it? Is it on video marker 23 seconds into the video? This is where they say it. Or is it on page five on line two in a different data set? It's kind of hidden away. So I want to give the affordances for checking the other side of the citation to see where is the evidence that backs that up. And then the other part is also source trust ranking. So if you're going to point to the web as your source of truth and say, well, here's the link that backs up my claim, then I want to also be able to say, well, nature.com, we trust that pretty highly. And some other website, maybe it's the Daily Mail, we don't trust it as much. So giving scores to where the information comes from and giving the affordances to allow us to back up the validity of the claims and giving auto systems like an immune system for truth in a sense to allow the system to also call out bullshit and give a CRM to fix the issues. So GitHub, GitHub issues, and we lifted part of that model to put into it so that you can talk about the issues in a structured way and emails can go back and forth and you can fix things. So I think there's many ways to zoom in to trying to get things right. And there are ways to beat the state of the art and to find a new standard in trying to provide validity to information. Interesting you brought up weight. So when you're looking at different sources and you're examining the weight to provide a particular source, how does that get evaluated? Because obviously, if it's a source you've never seen, it's much more difficult. Obviously, you're trying to find reference points to validate that component. And obviously, you mentioned AI because I'm assuming this is not done manually. But how do those two play together? Weight, some whatever machine learning or AI you have behind the scenes to understand and interpret that weight. Yeah, so that I think is a really hard problem, actually. It's like a page rank for truth. So it's like, rather than trying to get correlate a search intent that you might type into Google with a web page out there that may have the answer to your intent and trying to iterate around that loop and having an algorithm around that, it's kind of like we have a claim and the claim is claiming something in the sentence and someone's trying to point to a website that backs up their claim. You know, then you're trying to rank like the validity of all the claims of that website, you know, because there may be something on the Daily Mail that may be true. And there many are many facts on the Daily Mail that are true. And there may be some things that may not be true. So in a way, you'd have to like try and validate. I mean, you can do it in different ways. You could say, like, how frequently is that source being removed? You know, people are saying, okay, that source is just completely a terrible source. It shouldn't be used for validating claims. Or how often is the backup of the claim being validated by some kind of agent on the outside, which might be a human or an AI? So, you know, let's just say I write on Golden, you know, Cerebus has a power chip usage of 15 kilowatts, and they point to the website of Cerebus saying the power requirements 15 kilowatts. You could say, well, those facts correlate, and you could use that as a signal as well. But, you know, maybe Cerebus website is not publishing in general, and people aren't generally reading it. So there's a bunch of signals that I think would go into this. And you know, some of it's traffic, because you're looking for this kind of consensus network of trust. And I think there are problems in crypto as well for like, how do you trust an identity management? How do you trust this identity? And you kind of need to trust the network, you need to trust some kind of minimum cohort of network to go build it out further. And you can start pointing to nodes that you trust more. And there are various proxies to it as well. 
traffic is obviously a dangerous proxy. You might have some kind of alternative fax website, which might have tons of traffic and it's not necessarily the best signal. You could run in a kind of academic way and see like how they connect back into academia, how they connect back into nature.com or archive and the roots for that. So there's like structural components to that problem. I think there's like many different attacks on it to build some kind of scoring of index of like trustability of from a factual point of view. It is a different problem probably with parallels of like the general kind of indexing on the web. And I'll be interested if anyone's got any ideas, any of your viewers got any ideas, definitely email me as I think this is kind of a, an interesting problem to try and solve. Yeah, I, I'm fascinated by um, how humans, we go about seeking information, validating it, and how that gets modeled on the web. I think you can look at Yelp and you could probably in your own life see... You've asked plenty of people for recommendations of where to eat. And there's always a gap of who's telling you that, what's their context. And as humans, we can only ask X amount of people. And now with the web, obviously, we have deeper expectations of, yes, there's more information, but how do I validate and how deep does it go? And obviously, as a human, I can only read so many things. You're mentioning solving this by you know, multiple degrees of trust or, as you mentioned, you know, claim and proof models. But I do think it's an interesting problem because we humans do this every day in everything we do. And it's so automatic, but also it's sometimes it's a very shallow level and how you model the web, or rather, in your case, Golden, to have that trust factor, I guess, for lack of a better term, is fascinating. And Golden's early on some of these problems. I mean, we haven't solved that problem. You know, we've been working on some other problems of ingesting data and building the affordances around and building great editor tools and building a commercial model so that, you know, companies can query us and pay for research requests so that we can go and get data that's out there in the public and compile it for them, and they can access it via APIs. So there's lots of different problems in this roadmap. And this roadmap goes out probably 10 years or maybe unending. And you can always build better models in there. And one extra idea that came from your comment on the Yelp comment is, you know, getting to like the source of the actual information. So say there's a claim somewhere on some website, well, where did that come from? And, you know, when we're looking at this COVID-19 spread of like information there, disinformation, correct information, just trying to get the facts has been really hard. And when you look at a web page or tweets, you say, well, where did that come from? And then you can say again, well, where did they get that from? And you keep tracing back further and further and further until you get to the real source. And the source may be actually not on the web. It actually jumps into real life. Like it's in this book, in this warehouse, or it's this person. It was a witness that made a statement behind private doors. So I think a lot of the injection of the information is not like current, the structure of all this stuff on the web and in tweets is not really well categorized yet. And we don't have a good trace route or we don't have a good audit log of all the claims and statements and data that's out there on all the social media and all the web. And Golden's not kind of focused so much on that problem. That's an interesting problem. But, you know, just looking at the Twitter stream on certain hashtags, I would just love to be able to see, well, where did that information come from? And some of it's original, right? Some of it's an original idea you just come up with. And it, some of it's come from someone else, word of mouth, etc. Yeah. It's just really interesting because as you go back further, a thousand years, and you have a book written on a subject, we all take that as the truth of the time. There is no alternative idea. There's no one to ask. There's no other records. Maybe somebody finds a scrap of information in a parchment somewhere that might challenge it. But whatever was written down, we have to trust that as what the word of whatever the topic was, you know, 500 years, 200 years, I mean, just even maybe 100 years ago. And I find it interesting that as we're getting more information, our trust of that information is becoming much more difficult to validate and become comfortable with because there's so much information. And one piece of conflicting information will cause us in our paradigm of our minds to question the ripple effect of the rest of the information. Yeah. And that's interesting. When we think of like conspiracy theorists, if they get an assumption wrong in their framework, and that's like, there's kind of two parts of that. You mentioned the injection of incorrect data. Say you your processing framework in your mind was, and your assumption or framework was quite good and quite scientific and logical and rational, and you injected incorrect data into it, it could cause certain types of errors, right? And it even cause you to like rewrite your rule set. But if you had like something wrong in your processing, some kind of like belief structure that was like, didn't mirror reality, and how things really work, then, you know, if you took in another piece of information that was incorrect, you would stack the system, it would start to go wrong. And when I've watched programs like Ancient Aliens, I've just looked through and seen, well, they believe in all these different like compounding conspiracy theories because they started getting a couple of things wrong, but it's all consistent in their heads. It all fits together, but it's all globally wrong. And so like, it's interesting to try and be like, how do we become like globally correct on the information, getting the correct information in and the assumptions 
and the audit log. And yeah, as you said, like there's at least two problems happening right now. There's way more information out there. We're getting it much faster. So it's not getting time is a great filter. Time is a great filter for music. You know, if we look back through music, all these amazing classical pieces from the past have been remembered because they're the best ones. Mm -hmm. I'm sure there were terrible pieces of music that were written in the 16th century. But we look back and we're like, wow, classical music's great. Well, maybe classical music was crap, but the best ones made it through. So the classical music we hear today is great. So time is a great filter. And time is a great filter on, on facts and information as well. Because if it's true, you can trade on it. And if you can trade on it, it survives and it embeds itself into systems. And if it embeds itself into systems, and I mean, there are exceptions, and I'm not going to go there. Um, <laughs> there are exceptions to this where things survive that are completely wrong. They're consistently right inside their little framework, but they're wrong when they connect to reality. So um, yeah, there's some interesting problems here. And yeah, so back to that problem. So real time is a problem, the amount of data, and also everyone's got the microphone now. So everyone's got the microphone, so they're all producing original, in a sense, original like tweets and original research or like research in inverted commas, quotation marks for the Americans. <laughs> everyone's got a microphone, so there's a lot more injection of claims. So we got way more claims, way more data, and then we got lots of game theory occurring where people cluster on Twitter around certain principles and belief systems. And that creates like war zones. And then they, the game theory gets amped up because to survive the game, you've got to cluster together and you've got to get more extreme in your position. I call this the kind of like it's kind of modern societal schizophrenia when you put everybody on Twitter with a microphone, every mind is talking to each other and you get schizophrenic effects occurring across society. And we see that on Twitter. So we've got a bunch of these different problems. And then you've got trolls as well who inject the system with bad information and kind of like viruses in your immune system, injecting code into the system to try and mess around with it. So we've got all these different problems. And I want to bring a bit of sanity to our quest for understanding reality, which should be one of our most prized things in society is to try and understand reality. And you know that's been done in physics and science for a long time. And now with information, we have to get it done. And you know, even with search, you could make a search for something and your first result might be completely wrong. It might be the answer that's completely wrong. So we want to try and bring this deluge of information back to some kind of, you know, some kind of scientific framework for the storing the data. When you mention the sheer volume of you guys, you know, you the ambition of what you're trying to pull in and and we're talking about the speed at which data is being produced, the volume. When it comes to the speed at which you guys are adding on to Golden. How do the two work with each other? Because while you guys are looking for the claim proof scenario, validating and finding the piece of you know, content research, whatever it is to validate a claim, there could be within minutes, days, something that comes out, something that is identified that might you know, disprove something. Like, What kind of speed ratio do you guys have to work at to maintain that balance? The optimal would be to do it as new information as written to the web. That is an extremely hard problem, right? Because you got to do a full audit log on new claims coming through. And when it comes to like COVID-19, this is really interesting to watch because there is so much new information coming out. We don't know what's true and what's not true. And we have these institutions like CDC and other places that we expect to give us the real deal, the real information, right? And then there's like people that don't necessarily trust that or think we're getting like watered down political versions or the correct it or like people that this is the best information, we should go off this. So I guess the optimal system would be seeing everything coming through and trying to link together all the different claims that are coming out on Twitter, trying to look at the evidence and the signals, ranking things, and people trying to sort through algorithms, trying to sort through what's real, what's not real, and binding it to our corpus of stuff that we accept as consensusly correct. There's also like another view of this of like axiomatic correctness or like one plus one equals two. I can kind of trust that ish. <laughs> so, you know, that's like a different zone to if you look at like Wolfram Alpha stuff, you know, it's, there's a symbolic component and you can build up a lot of true things or a lot of like good quality information from that side. And the other route is like looking through all the vast information we have structured and unstructured and try and pull out things that you think are consistent that where you've got this consistent framework of all the data and humans believe it as well. And then you test it in reality, you trade off it, and it seems to work in reality. So you get your kind of testing framework off the back of reality when you test it. So um, there's a lot there, actually. I think it's not going to get solved like instantly, this problem, because I think it's going to get worse before it gets better, especially on Twitter. The COVID thing is a great test for informational systems. And you can see the news, well, the news, classic media do seem to be lagging massively from a technological standpoint in being able to chase down what's happening on the ground. They don't have the tools, right? 
they lost the distribution capability with Facebook and Twitter, and they don't have the research tools. There are some amazing journalists who can go deep on something. But when it's moving super fast in real time across many different countries, with many different people involved with conflicting information, it becomes overwhelming, I think, for the classic journalists. And they can summarize and pull out pieces. But if you look across the different media news for timelines on COVID, for example, a lot of the time they're missing like some of the latest stuff. So it's not breaking anymore. But if you look at the Twitter stream, you're seeing breaking stuff, but you're seeing also stuff that's like completely not true. So it's very hard to know what's real. I think there's going to have to be some like serious thinking in this area if we want to level up our kind of like connection to all this information that we're now seeing. Yeah. And I think what's fascinating about that is when you're producing information and speed is a component to which that information gets produced, right? So on Twitter, for example, as, as you mentioned, it's not just the fact that uh, you know, it's the ability to publish the tweet that's talking about you know, this virus, but also there's intrinsic value of being first to publish because you will be retweeted, you'll be reshared. And I think that puts a tremendous pressure on the production of information, which then puts a pressure on a product like Golden because then you know, if somebody shows a propensity for uh, you know, maybe producing rushed pieces that are slightly flawed, I mean, that obviously might not carry the same weight within a, a system like yours because it's a consistent issue that they're producing in terms of the information quality. Yeah, and one strategy for Golden there is that we try to map out like immutable information. So stuff that's not going to change like your birthday. And, you know, one of my engineers said to me the other day, like, there's no such thing as a mutable, which I kind of like that quote. I wanted to get a t-shirt. We talk about getting a t-shirt for it. <laughs> so we've been trying to get on, there's a spectrum there from like the situation's rapidly changing and the facts are changing all the time to like, there's this thing, you know, this company was founded in Delaware in 1996. No one's poked the claim for a long time, you know? So we've been trying to get the backbone in place, which is like things that are more set in stone and then build our way up because that gives you the framework to actually test the new claim, the latest claim against it and say, is it statistically out? So, you know, if you see someone make a claim that their chip is like 100 kilowatt power, which is wild, you know, you could say, well, you know, that's never happened before. So we need to dig in a bit and it highlights, you need the context. The context is the previous claims of the past that you consensusly or axiomatically ha happy with. And, you know, so that's part of the principle to try and log all the data. And so, you know, it's not a new service. It's kind of a barbell strategy for information in a sense, like build the backbone of immutable information that is not going to change and sit on top of that wild COVID-19 USA Twitter hashtag on Twitter and see like the fire hose of like everything coming at you. And it's like lots of stuff is like wrong and right. And it's kind of interesting to have that spectrum right now. And that spectrum is probably the opportunity of how to turn that fire hose of data, not just Twitter, but everywhere, because everything is producing more information. And there's more people that have the microphone and have, making more claims. And there's more machines and agents and AI will start writing stuff. And there's all this data that's going to be put out there and all these claims that can be put out there. How do you attach that to our consensus perception and reality and our log of data and our structure and you know, doing it in a way that works? And that, in a way, the information arbitrage opportunity to build that algorithm and that system, which is very complex, to be between the fire hose and your database. The one thing that I always come back to when I'm looking at a product like Golden is the information aggregation, the indexing, the validation, all those are one thing. What are your thoughts in terms of where the search will go? Because obviously with more data, searching becomes an equally complex problem. How does the platform handle the actual end user, the person who's actually trying to get to the information? Yeah, so I think, I mean, the search like in Golden like talking about search in Golden, I was talking about search in the wild. In the wild right now, Google, Bing, DuckDuckGo, you know, I think the, the products are becoming commoditized between each other. Like the interfaces look very similar. The, you know, page rank, you know, is an old an algorithm now and what is out of pattern or whatever. And then we got voice search, right? Which is like, you know, the series and the Google assistants and Alexas and other variations of that. So for me, like the normal search in the wild when you type things in, it's pretty commoditized on that model. And I do think there are better models where you type something in, you get the actual answer. You get a single result and you get the answer, which might be a plethora of options. Right now, those options are links. But I see that the future search being you search for something and you get the right answer. And I do think it's possible to do it, say for problems that we already know about. It might not be that we've solved the Riemann hypothesis yet and you say, is the Riemann hypothesis true or false? And the search engine can't answer it. 
because we don't know. And, and it, it would say, you know, humanity doesn't know the answer to this yet, but here are the latest papers for it. So I think search is not finished. And then that's the element that's abstracted from the method of putting the data in, i.e. typing it or voice. And then we've got this new abstraction layer, which is like, oh, I can do it via voice which has a different response. Normally it comes back with the audio response, non-visual. So your search answer is going to be different. But if I'm making the claim that we're kind of come down to search where it's giving you the right answer, that could easily fit well into an audio version of the answer. I, it could just read you the answer, right? Rather than... It's very hard to describe, say with Alexa, all the answers on a web page. Web page one, golden.com, forward slash blah, 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 link, blah, 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 description, blah, 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 web page two. So the, the audio version, if we're going with a verbal search, and voice assistance, then it actually correlates with having this coming back with the answer that you want, fulfilling the action that you wanted to achieve, right? Which is the extension of the search, which is all intents of any user action. So for Golden, you know, I want to be what we think that we can be the answer for a certain range of searches, not all searches, not all intent. All intent is a very large superset to say searching for an entity or an answer around the entity, Max Holdix age or when was Algorand founded or tell me about Naval Ravikant or how does CRISPR-Cas9 work? So all those kind of questions and searches we want to be able to fulfill a great answer to. And that's not all search. It's maybe 20% of search. So we see Wikipedia coming up a lot, you know, maybe 10% of the time for, for when you search for stuff. But it won't come up for like, book my flight tomorrow, please. You know, it's a different problem. So there's a connection of golden into search, but it's not all search. Because all search is all fulfillment of the user intent via some kind of way to let it know, you know. But we'll be improving that connection over time with gold and, you know, maybe we'll do some kind of natural language query. We've been talking about, about that in the office. But yeah, it's not going to try and cover all intent. So there, there are boundaries around it. And I think you need to have boundaries around your mission, actually, to make it more precise and, and make it achievable. Yeah, I mean, what you described, I mean, everyone wants that experience with their personal assistant, whether it's you know, Alexa, whatever device you have to actually get a semi-right response. I, right now, uh, the biggest challenge, the biggest obstacle of me using it, honestly, is that you know, with Siri, I get a list of 15 websites that it wants me to pick from. And Amazon randomly gives me whatever it thinks it's closest, you know, the, its best answer. And I think you know, when you were talking about Golden and that best answer, Wikipedia would fall short because you know, when you do search for stuff, you're right. Sometimes it's a lack of an entity, but... Uh, with what you're trying to accomplish, it sounds like, you know, seeing golden power, a lot of that verbal search could be, uh, again, with the right search parameters, obviously, could be very interesting. Yeah, for the subset of search of all user intent space, which is a user trying to find information on something, I think there's a better way to cut the web up and compile it into a structured data set that allows you to answer that user's request very quickly and very efficiently on the user side, whether you get the right answer, which may be no answer at all. Like the internet does not know this answer or the world does not know this answer. That's fine as well. And, you know, that's the way it's got to go. And right now we just point to websites with search. They do try and pull from some things out, but they don't really like compile like all the information that could be the correct answer for your search. Maybe search will go more verticalized, you know, where if it's about booking the flight, it goes into that kind of user action module, like, hey, can you do my homework for me? Or hey, can you reinstall my computer? That's like different space to, I want to know about this, please. So we might see some forks and breaking up of search. But you know, I think it'll be under one user umbrella for like the actual interface to go and like ask for it because you don't want to have to go to different places to ask for things. So I think it, you know, it could go more voice-based, but I think we'll still have a hybrid, right? Because it's yes. like re- audiobooks and normal books. People probably do both. Yes. And they both have pros and cons. Yeah, I think the narrow use of AI to understand something specific is where you know, I think Google does a great job of returning a bunch of you know, responses to whatever intent you have. But I think it's also harder because they're boiling the ocean to find what you, they think you're looking for. But the more narrow you get, the more context I think you could tie to what you're looking for. And I think that'll be the big difference of you know, how a Yelp versus a you know, LinkedIn or a Google search can change. Because obviously right now, you know, they're looking at uh, different parameters to apply to different contexts. And that cannot be an easy problem to solve. And there's definitely like an advantage in trying to solve all of it under one platform because the user only has to go to one place. But then for the specific actions like sub problems inside that user intent space, then I do think there are very specific products that can do a much, much better job. 
And that's why we see the existence of something like Quora or Wikipedia, because, you know, and all the websites underneath them, because they do a more specific job. And that that's good news, I think, because that means that the web doesn't end up with a complete monopoly with one company having just control and absolutely everything. And it's good for entrepreneurs and product builders and users to have like lots of exciting startups and companies making different solutions to it that are refined around that, that particular function. Absolutely. Now, I think what you guys are doing really cool. Obviously, I think you you, know, you mentioned ten year roadmap. I think you got a much bigger vision of what this product's going to do long term. And it sounds like you guys are proving the concept right now and, and doing some very interesting things around search. Yeah, we're working hard on it. And um, you know, if any of you just want to try and help build some of the information in a conical way, they can go ahead and do that to sign up and try and put interesting information. It might be putting their own companies in. Make sure to do it in a really neutral way as if someone else was writing about it, not yourself. Absolutely. I appreciate being on. And uh, I typically like to ask a couple of different questions, a final question. The one question I've been very curious about recently I've been asking is just what's the latest book you might have read or or is on your reading list that you're dying to read that you could share with us all? Yeah. So I've I just been reading Almost Completed Adventures of a Computational Explorer by Stephen Wolfram. And uh, so he's made Mathematica and Wolfram Alpha, which are both really cool products. It is a really interesting book. I highly recommend it. It's got all sorts of cool things inside there, like how he picked his logo in extreme detail. And it, it really makes you think, are we doing the process right when you make a decision? How deep are you going? How well are you really going deep? So that was cool to show the depth that they will go to to understand one of the product choices. There was some stuff about remote work because he's been in... I don't know whether I want to spoil... It's not spoiling the book because there's so much detail that you just have to read it anyway, even without the summary. Other parts are like, he's been a remote work CEO, I think from a very long time ago. And that's a pioneer, including like other cool things that he, he, you know, Twitch streams, his meetings internally in the company. It's very open. And people from the outside who don't work at the company can give ideas. And he also talks about languages and how you can build abstracted languages. It's really cool. I've got one or two chapters to go. And also the history of Mathematica is, is very compelling. I won't give any secrets away in the book, but it's really worth it. It's a pleasure to read. Awesome. Yeah, we'll include that in the show notes. And then if somebody wants to reach out, what's the best way for somebody to reach out and kind of contact you if they have questions or they have a follow-up or whatnot? Sure, they can email me at jude at golden.com. Awesome. I appreciate you uh, spending time with us and uh, providing insight in terms of what you guys are doing. Best of luck and what you guys are trying to accomplish. Yeah, thanks. It's fun to go over everything. <laughs> 